Hello and welcome to this edition of a page from history. I am Nilanjan Mukhopadhyay. The 1960s and 70s witnessed the second wave of feminism. In the late 19th and early 20th century, emphasis was on the issues of suffrage and legal obstacles to gender equality. From the 1960s, the focus widened to issues like sexuality, family, workplace and reproductive rights. The second wave also drew attention to domestic and sexual violence. As the international feminist movement gained momentum, the United Nations General Assembly declared 1975 as the International Women's Year. It also organized the first World Conference on Women in Mexico City. For 40 years, 40 years later, it is time for stock taking. The year 2015 is a year of anniversaries as far as women's issues are concerned. In 1975 also, the Committee on Status of Women in India, the first ever such body, submitted its report. In 1980, the Second World Conference on Women was held in Copenhagen. In 1985, the Nairobi Conference was held. It is also 20 years since the Fourth World Conference on Women was held in Beijing. But fresh issues remain and require close attention. I am joined today by a distinguished panel of experts to talk about the entire gamut of issues affecting women and society. My first guest on this program is Indu Agniotri, uh, the Director of Center for Women's uh, Development uh, Studies. Pamela Filippo is a very senior journalist, a very old voice in the women's movement in India, also a fellow with the ICSSR. And finally, I have uh, Namita Bhandare, another senior uh, uh, journalist who has also been a colleague of mine at some point, currently also the gender editor of Mint. Welcome to the program, all of you. Pamela, let me begin with you to try to understand, to get a go back and look at 1975 to get a sense, you know. Many people talk about that 1975, the declaration of the International Women's Year, was brought in a kind of a glass nose as far as women's issues was concerned. That for the first time, it became and you know, it became the undertone of a large number of conversations and also in certain areas it definitely acquired much more uh, prominence. You know, how do you look at when we look at uh, the declaration of a year as the women's year and then followed by a decade long year of uh, women, you know, basically talking about women's rights, how do you contextualize it? You know, for India specifically, yes. the 75 meant that we had to submit a national report right. to the UN. And that process of writing that report was very, very important mm -hmm. for the Indian women's movement and for Indian society at large. Mm. You know that Status of Women Committee report, which right. came out, which was submitted in, in December uh, 1974. Yeah. 74. Mm. For mm. December 74, it was submitted mm -hmm. and it was tabled before Parliament in, in 75. 75. Yeah. Now, that report was the first. Uh, recognition that the Constitution of India had let the women of the country down mm -hmm. and that's in fact the opening lines of that report saying mm -hmm. that you know the Constitution that uh, guarantees equality between men and women you know has mm -hmm. let the women of India down it was quite a startling statement because it was uh, presumed that uh, a welfare state would look after all segments of its population mm. equally. But here was a government report saying, no, that was not the case. And, it was uh, and that this was backed with a lot of investigation and data. And you had very good minds, wonderful um, you know, legal experts like Lothika. Um, uh, well, the uh, the yeah. founder, founder chairperson of uh, CWDS, Dr. Veena Majumdar, Veena was the Mazumdar. member secretary of the committee All and uh, Fulrenu Guha, a very uh, absolutely. important they were leader really of that amazing time. women. All yes. of them had something to contribute from a different vantage point, and that is what made that report so important mm. because it brought uh, it brought both legal and educational and um, uh, economic insights mm. into looking at how women in the country fared mm. and it was very futuristic in many ways because it right. talked about things like matrimonial property who had ever articulated such a thought right. earlier right. 
So it was an exciting moment. Coming at a time in the mid 70s when they're definitely much more orthodox than what it is today, it was really a fast picking thing. Let me check with uh, Indu. How do you look at you know thing even you know not just in a national context but even internationally? What did the UN General Assembly deciding to declare an entire year and then following it up with the first conference you know in uh, Mexico City and also declaration of the 76 to 1985 as the decade for women. What well, I really think uh, there are two things. Uh, there is a national context, part yeah, of which yes. uh, Pamela spelt out. Uh, there was a more overtly political context. Right. Uh, by the time the report really gets circulated, we, we are into emergency. the emergency yeah. period, as we see in so Indian history. So that is the time when the rights of the women were particularly uh, uh, suppressed? And a lot of women, so you'd be surprised to know, people who later came out and fought on uh, those issues, said that they actually read the report while they were in jail. jail. <laughs> so that was uh, an interesting right. take on what it meant to be a woman in 1975 mm -hmm. uh, uh, and how you could be a woman in power and a woman who was behind bars. Right. So it uh, put a question mark in terms of a homogeneous conception of mm. uh, women in India, both in ideological as well but as... Indira Gandhi had actually set up the committee in the early yes. 1971, I think, yes, at the time uh, when she was, yeah. you know, she had already been started to be declared as the undisputed yeah. leader of India. And uh, uh, so that was one part of the context and I think in, at the national level the committee garnered a huge uh, resource base from Indian social science tests, you know, mm. particularly. So apart from the members of the committee whom Pamela mentioned, they set up task forces, they sent out questionnaires, they held meetings mm. in different regions, etc. So that was one part of the context. I think at the international level also the context was very interesting because the Commission on the Status of Women really was pushed by the Eastern Bloc mm. and by the Non-Aligned Movement. Right. They really pushed for this and you will notice that all the General Secretaries of the, uh, the uh, mm. Commission came usually from the non-aligned uh, countries, you right. know, so, uh, or uh, with different kind of uh, um, a more radical perspective and background. Mm -hmm. uh, Lucille Mayer from the Caribbeans, right. uh, then um, uh, Vida Tomsic who came from Yugoslavia at mm -hmm. that time, uh, then uh, uh, I think uh, I'm forgetting Nairobi who it is, but uh, mm -hmm. Beijing is Gertrude Mangela who right. comes from Nairere's team you know so actually what we must understand is that at the international context it was not just that it was all about celebrating women womanhood mm. etc but also there was a political edge to pushing for equality pushing not just, for not just within the gender context but also yes. also between yes. the various you know, yes. Various words, if I exactly. can actually Exactly. You know, uh, Lucille Mayer came from a slave background. Yes. Vida Tomsic had been, uh, f uh, came from a serf family right. in Eastern right. Europe. So these people brought both their individual as well as their uh, specific... So there was a huge amount of personal heritage which exactly. they were bringing in into... So, uh, so I think one has to see that uh, 1975 and the decade that came with it could happen because at the international level there was a political climate which was pushing hmm. for debates on equality, right. etc. And, right. uh, and democracy uh, with regard to women also specifically. Right. Namita, when you, uh, you know, look back, you know, you know, by the time, uh, you know, you or me came into this profession, uh, 75 had already happened. A lot of other things had also happened. You had also had a fairly, uh, fairly vigorous uh, women's movement within India, raising issues which definitely kept on becoming, uh, you know, wider and wider, looking at more, def you know, issues. But to begin with, what I asked uh, Pamela and Indu both, if you actually try to look and define for what does the recognition of a year for women, a decade for women, the very fact that the entire international communities within the political context within India, a separate committee being set up to study the status of women, something which had never been done till that time, just about 30 years, uh, almost 30 years after independence. You know, how do you look at uh, you know, the relevance of it 40 years down the line? Uh, absolutely, uh, whether it's a year, a decade or a day, right. 
devoted to women's issues and I'm not talking about the crass kind of commercialization right, which exactly, you're seeing from yes. cosmetic companies who are uh, celebrating uh, international, in international women's day happy women's day yeah, it's not a happy day, day. and uh, uh, absolutely. selling fair and lovely uh, uh, you know, creams. absolutely so putting that aside of course it's important it's important to remember uh, you know, you need a day or a year or a decade, and of course you don't. You know, mm. a, ideally in an ideal world, 365 days of the year should be Women's Day. Mm. But it's nice to have that one fulcrum around mm. which you say, okay, let's take stock. Mm. What have we done? What, where is the battle going? Mm. Where are we headed? What are the mm. issues we need to be sorting out? Mm. And that is what makes a day, a year or a decade significant. Mm. Right. Pamela, very early in the program, you know, while I was introducing, I did say, you know, that this wave of feminism which started internationally from the 60s, you know, started looking at other issues also, which was not the case in the late 19th century or the early 20th century when workers' rights, you know, uh, you know the participating in election suffrage and you know, all that were very important. This is also the time when very peculiarly uh, various metaphors or various you know, euphemism started being linked to the women's movement. This entire phrase, which possibly, you know, if you actually go and look into it, that something like that never happened. But by and large, there has been this feminism in the West, prim primarily in the U U U.S., has been linked to this phrase called bra burning, you know, which became a kind of a continuing phrase, though if you go back and look at it, probably it was never used. It was said in a completely different context about a protest uh, on against the Vietnam War where people were drafting the draft letter, uh, burning their draft letters. Mm. That is how actually it, it came into. But the point is that the second wave definitely was much more broad based. Would you agree? Totally. And here I think this whole thing about the female body hmm. came into play in the sense that, I mean, uh, uh, finally what was uh, uh, burning of braziers, uh, hmm. burning, the bra burning, um, no, I think idea. it was a very Metaphor. important thing because, because, because trash cans were set up to throw all cosmetics which were basically to, to uh, you know, to beautify the female exactly. body from a, uh, oh, yeah. from a male perspective. Yeah, so that was The way it. the male so men wanted it. So it was a very radical idea. Right. I, I believe some instances of such events did take place, I believe. You know, in Atlanta City, I believe mm -hmm. there were meetings and women did take out their bras mm -hmm. and burn them. Mm -hmm. But that is... But that became be, a huge, just yeah, a symbolic thing. Yeah. yeah, it became symbolic yeah. and yeah. I think... Um, there was also the idea of our bodies, ourselves, right. the idea, of, and so all these were very nascent ideas, but became important over a period of time. Don't forget the contraceptive pill right. had just come in the 60s, right. and the idea of being in control of one's reproductive right. life right. was amazing. So no, 71, in India, you know, legalized abortion, and I, I remember yeah. you know, you know, a few years ago, I had done a program here yeah. on the same uh, page from history yeah. where yeah. we took note of 40 years of uh, the anti-abortion laws, and giving, very important because it gave the women the right to uh, decide on... Uh, you know, the, uh, on the essentially gave them reproductive rights. Right. Yeah. Only in India, it had it came yeah. from a different provenance, yeah. as yeah. it were, because yeah. it was more for family planning than right. for right. reproductive but rights. But at the end of it, if it benefited women, I think uh, that was absolutely. quite Absolutely. <laughs> I'll take a little break at this time yeah. and then come back and resume <laughs> okay. this conversation. By sheer coincidence, the International Women's Year was followed by the emergence of a vibrant women's movement in India. It drew members of the civil society, media, students, and even some political leaders. The trigger was a verdict of the Nagpur bench of the Bombay High Court in the case which came to be known famously as the Mathura rape case. It unleashed revulsion and this converted into increased consciousness. Be with us. This program will continue. Welcome back to a page from history. It is four decades since the year 1975 was observed at the International Women's Year. The UN's decision reflected the onset of the second wave of international feminism. In though if I may go back to the, the late 70s, you know, the Mathura rape case, you know, I, that is the time when the women's movement was coming to the fore. You were my senior in university and I, uh, there's also a certain period of, you know, where uh, people like, you know, young men like me also became part of an understanding that yes, there was a dimension called the women's issues also, you know, going outside the campus and sticking posters in. Uh, Ram Krishna and government colonies, you know, a huge act of politicization, you know. But if you go back and look at the development of the women's movement within India, how do you, uh, you, know, you know, draw its history? Well, I think firstly, uh, the most critical part really is what we uh, still seem to know very little about, 
although there's a lot of historical mm. research, which is the pre-independence period, right. when I think very clear and close links were forged with the anti-imperialist struggle. Right. And uh, I think that really brought women out into the mainstream. Yes. In, and their participation uh, in the national movement, uh, Their participant, uh, participation in the national movement and with very clear uh, statements on behalf of women in terms of the rights, both in terms of mm. education, voting rights, particularly at a time when the British government wanted to give voting rights uh, only on a very concessional right. and restricted basis as spouse and uh, with respect to property and education. Mm. And the women's organizations which were then there took the position f uh, in favor of universal franchise, realizing that if they accepted property rights and educational qualifications as the criteria, most of the women mm. would be left would out. Be left out so that was one. They also focused on a lot of other issues. Um, in incidentally, there was a report which came out in the 1940s. It's printed, but it's actually prepared in the late 30s when Nehru sets up the National Planning Committee of right. the uh, Congress. Uh, That's in the late 40s. In yeah. the hope that uh, now we will be going for yeah. a more uh, clear uh, role in uh, independent India or to looking mm. towards independence and the report of the subcommittee on women is very interesting it mm. has a huge long chapter on women's work it has a chapter on population and mm. health and mm. it has a chapter on uh, family etc on laws mm. so there is something before it although uh, we can't say that that guided uh, towards equality. And is that the reason as to why uh, women were given voting rights to within the con and there was well, not much uh, the debate in the constituent assembly on the this? The congress uh, uh, adopted the fundamental rights resolution right. and uh, took the position right. of universal franchise uh, in 1931 itself. So that was, right. uh, I think, important. But I think uh, the other part that is interesting and important is that, uh, and that uh, understanding comes out very clearly in towards equality also. That uh, towards equality does not see the issue of uh, women's rights as a, only a gender question. Right. It builds it and pitches it into the larger question of equality of the uh, uh, development processes of, of, of the underprivileged rights of, of the underprivileged and it makes a very clear statement that women's rights uh, are neither an issue in uh, to be seen in terms of hmm. a notion of traditional backwardness it uh, very clearly says that it is modern processes which are leading to marginalization of women and it further goes on to say it is macro development policies which are contributing to this process mm. of marginalization. So it did not uh, uh, sort of get caught in this bind that we continue to see in the public discourse right. today about tradition versus modernity uh, and uh, particularly with regard to cultural norms for women, mm. etc. Incidentally, it is towards equality which mm. first brings out uh, and highlights the whole issue of declining sex ratio as right. it was then called. Today we segregate between general sex ratios and child sex right. ratios. But towards but equality... They were able to establish that, that the, yes, it was that declining. From 1921 onwards, and it also drew a correlation with declining work participation of women. Right. So the fact that women were increasingly coming to be seen as a burden and it tried to explore those links between economic participation and uh, women's status and then the reflection right. in terms of cultural right. bias, right. prejudice. But Pamela, you also culture. agree that, that what really came out and got articulated in the mid-70s with the participation of a large number of people from the middle classes, the women as well as men, uh, the civil society participation, you know, that was also the, the post-emergency period when there was actually an opening up and le leading to a large number of other movements. The environmental movement came of age around that time. Various other issues came up. But it has the direct linkages, as uh, Indu is talking about, from the, the national movement and through the 50s and 60s it continued. Even those issues on which there were huge stumbling blocks, uh, you know, the, the, the entire debate within Constituent Assembly which got resolved, or the Hindu court bills, the right of uh, women in family uh, properties, uh, the issue of dowry, and then eventually we were talking in the previous segment, you know, the uh, abortion being legalized. Now, you see a, a direct uh, common narrative. 
Of course, there is a common narrative mm -hmm. because if one was not stated, the other would not have happened. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the emergency and the post-emergency period was a time when people felt they needed to articulate and defend their rights. Mm -hmm. It was a spontaneous kind of feeling that was articulated, not just, um, I mean, as media people, we were conscious of it, of course. Mm -hmm. But in society, as a whole, it was amazing how people spontaneously came out on various issues. And there was a lot of linkages between, say, the environmental movement mm. and the women's movement. Chipko, right. when Chipko. the women of Chipko came out and hugged trees and said that these trees, these ash poplars are, you mm. know, we need to defend them because our whole livelihood and life mm. revolves around them. It had a resonance in the women's movement. Right. Similarly, Fisher's, uh, the Fisher's uh, uh, folks strike, mm. that was so important for women here because women, women also were also part of that, um, you know, they were also affected by the economy of the sea, you mm. know, because they were the traders, the s fish would come in and the mm. women would go and sell the fish. So the women saw themselves as So it broadly reflects to what Hindu was saying that in the Absolutely. Towards Equality report, you know, the the entire thing was that it was not being seen only as a women's issue, but it was being seen as a you know issue of equality for right. a large number of other people. You know, you know be it underprivileged or even and women's even public presence. Yes. That's why for the first time, 30% reser 33% reservations for mm. the at the local body stage. O although at the legislative assembly stage they had a dispute, uh, and two only two members stood up for mm. uh, you know reservations for women mm. you know the women's mm. reservation bill but the idea was first planted in that particular report and it's amazing mm. you know that the women saw that unless you had reservation they will not be able to take part in decision right. making at the local level right right right, right. now Mita, quite often it is uh, you know presumed by a large number of people that women's movement uh, in India is largely restricted to the middle class and the upper classes that it's a kind of a, a fad of the rich, the, the, the people who are not underprivileged but in India there has been a very strong tradition of women pre presence in the working class movement, in the peasant movement but yes a lot of responses, a lot of attitudes have changed in the middle classes most reflected in the campuses you know, where as journalists we have seen the evolving culture through the decades you know how do you really look at that evolving culture on women's issues in educational institutions and among the student community no firstly i don't think it has been seen in fact the examples that have mm. been cited by pamela and indu are not middle class movements mm. chipko movement no they definitely are not but yeah. by and large there is a there is a way of painting the women's movement as essentially middle class i'm not there sure I, I don't think that the women who came out for in, in uh, protest against the mathura judgment were strictly speaking middle class the mm. dowry movement for instance right. was led by people yes i guess you could extend the definition but they they were led by mothers mm. uh, many of them illiterate who were protesting the murder of their daughter right. and and I mean Satya Rani Chadda mm -hmm. uh, you know and, and, and uh, Shah Jahan Appa, mm -hmm. Shah Jahan Appa mm -hmm. was not middle class right. by any stretch uh, uh, so you know I am not sure that these movements in fact I would say that now post 2012 you saw a lot more of middle class participation mm -hmm. but middle class has not traditionally participated in street protests mm -hmm. that has not been their, uh, their, their arena mm -hmm. uh, so to speak it was 2012 that changed that. It was 2012 that brought a large number of students uh, and also older people, a mm. large number of men out on the streets, uh, outraged over what they saw uh, as a flawless uh, uh, victim. You know, mm. she was in every way a good girl. You know, mm. let's not forget, I mean, I'm not trying to belittle that protest, but let's remember that that narrative fitted in very neatly into the middle class morality of who is a good girl. This was mm. a very hard working girl. She was uh, aspirational. She wanted to be a doctor. Mm. She was not like the Park Street victim sitting in a bar, single mm. mother. I mean, I don't see... No, but still, she was not a good girl for a large number of people. What was she doing with a with a, m a man who was also a friend, you know, at uh, fairly late I'm not sure that was the, the thinking at that time. I think mm. uh, this uh, uh, this sort of controversial documentary has brought that question up. Mm. But in many ways, she was blameless. 
you know, and a lot of people were just, you know, she had checked. I mean, as far as even as far as I'm concerned as a mother, she had ticked off every single item on my safety checklist. She mm. had a mobile phone. She was with a male friend. She was not out late at night. She had just gone to see a movie. So in that sense, she was not what some politicians have called adventurous. Mm. You know, she was not an adventurous woman. And so perhaps that is why you had the middle class responding in such large numbers mm. and so loudly and so vociferously across India in protest against against right. that crime. Right. Indu, if may I want to ask you, you know, looking in terms of the class participation in the women's movement you know, and comparing it with what was happening internationally through the 80s and you know, even the 90s, you know, do you find commonality between India and the rest of the world or was it something different uh, only happening? You know? I think there's a commonality of concern certainly mm -hmm. in terms of issues particularly of sexual violence uh, and discrimination mm. etc. Uh, but I think the Indian context is very different uh, given right. our society uh, and I would say across the cities uh, yes there is a middle class presence but that's also because our media will always focus on more right. middle class spokespersons uh, there's also a pro-English uh, bias in terms of spokespersons you know uh, in t uh, so but that is uh, reduced considerably as uh, yeah but you know, in terms of participation languages have grown but in stronger. terms of participation and the backbone of the struggle mm. even through the 70s and from the then 80s, onwards yes. i think certainly w whether we look at it in tamil nadu where uh, the organizations really started focusing on uh, uh, women's issues from the early 70s mm. um, and uh, uh, they, they had the struggle on food uh, they had uh, uh, issues of caste-based violence, you know, the uh, Kiliman Valley, uh, the killings, etc. So uh, there was always uh, uh, the strength of the movement coming from the mass of ordinary women. In mm -hmm. Delhi, for instance, I can say when the Janwadi Mahila Samiti starts its work right. in 1980 in Delhi, the strength of the movement really comes from the working class uh, base and units uh, where textile uh, workers, wives mm -hmm. and uh, those uh, uh, section of people were living either who were attached to the textile mills in terms of um, you know other forms of linkages mm. or where they had been right. relocated uh, or for instance the whole struggle for civic amenities which is often not seen as directly right. women's movement but where the women who were you know new migrants to the city who were struggling on a day-to-day -day basis and if you went to the bastis you know uh, right. say people like us who were coming from our university mm. locations and very middle class locations the issues that they, the women mm. would talk about and which they wanted to take up would be safai nahi hoti hai, ration right. card nahi hai, they were very, so, kaam dilwa do, right. those were very very basic issues and we were very clear that we had to take up those issues if uh, we had to negotiate right. the idea of women's rights right. with a larger section of right. people. Right. 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 I'll come back to all of you in a while, uh, I'm take a small break. In India, patriarchy found new ways to entrench its position and continue discrimination on gender lines. Technological advancement with new machines made prenatal sex determination possible. It resulted in sex selective abortions. The decline in child sex ratio in India is evident by comparing census figures. But we can spend hours discussing just that. Stay with us. This program will continue. <laughs> 